I would um, go to Washington and see if I could undermine the lobbying process. <laughs> undermine the lobbying process. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the gentleman I was talking to said he wouldn't do much difference, but he would do more uh, self-development and education stuff. You know, perhaps maybe have a bit more time for that. Okay. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. As a, a retired or a surgeant person, I would do more or less precisely what I'm doing, but throw in a, a lot of trouble. Yes. I'm concerned about everything, and therefore I've surrounded myself with things now that I don't have to work, which things which actually my heart is in. Yeah. Not sitting on the couch eating crisps. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, another, give me another, another few here. Yeah. Create benignly. Create what? Benignly. Benignly. Yeah. Create benignly. Create what? I would like to have a house of my own. Uh huh. And a land around it to use my own. Uh huh. And what would you use it for? Uh, I think growing ancient grain crops. Ancient grain crops? Yeah. And what would you do with this? Would you grow just enough for you, or would you grow more? Depends. <laughs> <laughs> well, money's not an issue, with, you know. If people would like them, I suppose they could have them. Okay. Because they could just buy those grain crops from somewhere else. Okay. Very right, good. Yeah. Another? Another couple? Yeah? Things I want to do. Things you want to do. Which are? <laughs> <laughs> Spoke, both thought that we wanted to find ways to help people more, just kind of generically. And we discussed in, in um, Secret Millionaire, you know, how mm -hmm. people get involved in different groups and kind of find ways to help people overcome various problems. And things. All right, so I'm getting a, a good sense of it. Um, so basically, all you all you people are irrational, <laughs> <laughs> and your 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 choices <laughs> violate. The principal assumption underneath all of mainstream economic thinking, which says that human beings' fundamental motivation is to maximize rational self interest. <laughs> that if you are not compelled to work and to contribute to society through the inducement of money, that you would not work. That work is subject to what they call disutility, the disutility of work, which says that you don't really want to work. So if you, you would rather just sit on the couch, eat crisps, watch the soaps, and play World of Warcraft. But if you did that, then you would starve. And you would not be able to meet your needs and fulfill your desires. Therefore, you will sacrifice that time in front of the two, in front of the, the, the TV, uh, and do something in order to, to get rewarded, to get compensated for the sacrifice of your time and your energy, to get compensation, and, 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 and do those things that contribute to others and not yourself, that contribute to society and not yourself, um, because you're induced to by money. That's, that's a fundamental assumption of economics. And that assumption doesn't exist in isolation from uh, more general ideology uh, and, and more, a, a more general narrative that uh, underlies our civilization. Uh, you find it in evolutionary biology as well that, that says yes. It's not just human beings that maximize their own, their, their rational self-interest, but that 
that, that, or that monetary self-interest, because monetary self, money is kind of a cipher for uh, reproductive self-interest. And biology has taught us, and this is actually becoming obsolete biology, but it's, that's not well known yet. Biology has taught us that our genes and the genes of all beings program them to maximize reproductive self-interest, to survive and reproduce. And money helps you do that. So then there's this problem of altruism, this problem that is coming up right now with all of you irrational people who are seeming to violate this assumption. Well, how do you explain that? There are basically two explanations um, with many variants in biology. Uh, one explanation is that this is kind of a, a, a misdirected program that originally originated, it originated to, to um, uh, motivate you to take care of your close kin who share your genes. So if you sacrifice something of your well-being for the sake of your children, you're actually benefiting your uh, genetic interests. Uh, and, and now this, this program gets misapplied and sometimes we end up caring for people and sacrificing for people who we're not actually genetically related to, um, but that's the origin of this altruism. And there's a second explanation that says altruism is basically a mating display that says, that says I am so fit that I can afford to squander my resources uh, you know, to take care of somebody else. Um, so that's kind of, that's, that's, those are two ways that, that um, altruistic behavior is kind of fit into uh, the, this paradigm of, of separation, this paradigm of selfish genes, the paradigm of everybody in it for themselves, the paradigm of competition. But when I look into myself and when I have conversations with people, you know, what would you do in the absence of this financial pressure? Most people do the kind of things that you're, you're or want to do the kind of things that, that you're talking about. To serve, to give, to create, to make the world more beautiful, to make the world better, to serve other people, to give of your gifts. And it's kind of the opposite of what economists say. It's the force of money that stops us from doing that. So I ask, what would, what would have to happen for money to be aligned with the gift? And I think that these deep questions of what is human nature are unavoidable when we're talking about this. Now, here's a puzzle, though. I mean, it sh when you look around the world, boy, it sure looks like selfishness and greed do rule the world and that they are the problem. <clears throat> it's hard to imagine. Why are, are these corporations who are controlled by the wealthy doing all of these things to bring even more money to the wealthy? Why? The, the, our mind just jumped to the conclusion that well, they must be greedy. They must, there must be something wrong with them. Why would anybody want more than they could possibly use? Where does this insecurity come from? I was suspicious early on about the explanation of greed. It's a little too convenient. And it's a little bit too consonant with what I call uh, the war on evil, which has been a defining feature of our civilization for probably thousands of years. And it's also allied to the paradigm of control. And it says the way to make the world a better place, the way to make yourself a better place, is to, is to eliminate the bad thing. Going back thousands of years uh, to early agricultural societies, the way to make the world a better, to, 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 to enhance our well-being is to exterminate the wolves, to exterminate the weeds, to control the floods, um, to, to, to defeat the enemy. And this way of thinking is a form of separation from nature. And, and we're very comfortable in that. 
were very comfortable with, with the solution of destroying the bad guy. It's in every movie, almost. Every action movie, at least, and most kids' movies. That the problem in the, 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 the plot is this. The plot is the same. The plot is that there is a problem caused by an inexplicably evil, deranged being. The evil lion and the Lion King, uh, the, the evil general and avatar, uh, the evil stepmother, the evil this, the evil that, who's just inexplicably bad. And, and the solution is to destroy this person, to utterly humiliate, usually to kill this evil being, and then the problem is solved. And we're surrounded by this way of thinking. It's not just in the media and entertainment industry. Um, it pervades our culture. You can see it, for example, in the US foreign policy. You know, where's the bad guy? Let's kill the bad guy. And then we're so perplexed when we do remove Saddam Hussein or Osama bin Laden. And if the problem isn't solved. You know, we're perplexed. It's worse. It's worse. <laughs> yeah. And just as we're perplexed, when we develop the antibiotics and we develop the weed killers, the herbicides, the pesticides, the insecticides, and we kill this bad thing, and the problem, and, and this technology creates all these unintended consequences, which we apply the same mentality of control to, and the problem gets worse and worse and worse. We're perplexed. And, and as these unintended consequences proliferate out of control, we, we still reflexively and habitually apply the same kind of solution, but with an increasing sense of helplessness and bewilderment. As it becomes, as, as the apparent benefits um, become um, weaker and weaker, um, and, and the problems grow greater and greater. You know, the first application of chemical fertilizers had tremendously dramatic effects. Now we have to put more and more fertilizer just to maintain constant yields, because the soil is so depleted, dead, dead from all these inputs, falling apart because there's no bacteria to, and, and fungi to gum it together, you know, more and more and more for less and less and less of them, in fact, diminishing marginal returns. Would say. So anyway, this whole way of thinking is breaking down. And that's why I'm, I'm suspicious of, okay, let's make <coughs> greed the enemy, and let's conquer greed, conquer the greed people, tear down, the, and, and, and conquer greed within ourselves. Not a very deep revolution. It's the same mindset applied to maybe a different target. But I think that right now we are entering a revolution in our means and in our perceptions not just a revolution in our ends. So if greed isn't the explanation, what is? I'll offer you a hypothesis. And I'll do it by, by way of explaining fundamentally how the money system works. So suppose, uh, do you guys play a game called musical chairs here? Mm -hmm. okay. yep. Okay. <laughs> we can play it right now, you know, we have, um, you know, maybe just this section of seats, uh, there's not quite enough seats for everybody, so we'll play the music and we'll all be dancing around and the music stops and we'll have a mad scramble for the seats. And, and let's say that, that if you don't get a seat, it's not just that you're out of the game. If you don't get a seat, um, you're out of your house. Uh, you're out of your apartment, and your kids go hungry. Like, really bad things happen from this. So, the music stops, and everybody's rushing for a seat, elbowing each other out of the way, pushing and shoving, you know, because there's not enough seats. And here's the economist looking at it and saying, yep. I'm right about human nature, look at it. It's everybody for themselves. Human beings are naturally competitive. And maybe there's one or two altruistic people in there who are, oh, you look like you need the seat more than me. You have to have the seat. That's the exception. And those people are doing something heroic, sacrificing their own interests. Uh, but the rule is 
everybody's in it for themselves, competing with each other. Yep, that's human nature. But is that really human nature? Or is that a consequence of the rules of the game? What if there were enough seats for everybody? What if you had a, a, a game where everybody has a different size butt, and there's many, many different seats, and some have hard cushions, and some have soft cushions, some are wider, some are narrower, you know, and the, and the music stops, and then and everybody's trying to find just the right seat for, them, for, 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 for themselves. And, and sometimes two people will, have, will, will rush for the same seat. And then they might say, well, who really would benefit most from this seat? Is there a seat that's better for you? And let's find a way that everybody can get the best seat. What if the game were like that? That would bring out a very different human nature. But our system is much more like the first game. And it's because of the way money is created in our system. It's created. And this is going to... I'll tell you the basics of how it's created, and then I'm going to circle it back to explain why money is not your friend, and why it's driving the destruction of the ecological basis of life on Earth. In a nutshell. Ten minutes. <laughs> it's very much like a game of musical chairs. So, say I am... And I think, I'm wondering how much to simplify it, um, whether to go through the whole thing about central banking and commercial banking and stuff. How, 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 how nerdy are people here? <laughs> I'm going to simplify, yeah, simple, okay. <laughs> the book is a much more detailed account. But this, but this is basically, basically accurate. Um, money is created by lending. I'll touch on that. So at the central bank level, uh, the, the Bank of England or the Federal Reserve or the uh, European Central Bank will buy, well, traditionally buy government securities, buy, buy bonds, government bonds, um, on the market. Um, Lately, they'll be buying other kinds of assets as well. And the way that the central bank buys them is simply by writing a number or typing a number into an account. The central bank won't take money from somewhere else and, and use that money to buy the securities. The central bank creates money out of nothing. It just writes the, writes the number into, into an account. In a process, so simple that it boggles the mind. A fairly similar thing happens, and, and, that's, and, that's, and that's where the money, that, that's where reserves come from, bank reserves. A similar thing happens to get money into the hands of businesses and, and ultimately in the hands of consumers. Uh, a commercial bank will um, lend you, say, a million pounds for a business loan, and it creates that money in your account. It doesn't transfer that money from someone else's account or from anywhere else. It writes that number in your account. Now, reserves come into play when the check, when you write a check on that account and the checks have to clear and everything like that, and then, and then it draws on the central bank level, but that's an unnecessary complication. For all intents and purposes, money is created by lending. So let's say I lend everybody in this room a million pounds each. So I've lent out a hundred million pounds. And it's maybe a business loan. Okay? And you could even say that this is the entire economy and I'm the entire banking system. Because all money is created the same way for all intents and purposes. So I lend everybody a million pounds. And say that it's at 7% interest for 10 years or whatever, let's say over, in 10 years you'll need only 2 million pounds. Now, that's not a problem for most of you, right? Because maybe, because all of you are smart, creative people, and you're going to work hard. You're going to create goods and services, and you're going to sell them to other people in this room, and you're going to earn not just the 2 million pounds that you owe me, but you're going to earn 5 million pounds. 
and you're going to pay me back my $2 million, and you're going to be rich yourself because you are going to work really hard. You're going to, um, I don't know, cut down some forests and sell the lumber to each other. You're going to uh, open a restaurant and sell food to each other. You're going to, you're going to do all kinds of things. Do you see a problem? Is there a problem? The problem is that everybody is in the same boat. Everybody has received a million pounds, and everybody owes me two million pounds. I've created a hundred million pounds of money and two hundred million pounds of debt. Which means, just like in the game of musical chairs, there's not, it's set up that there's not enough. And if that were all of the story, half of you would have to go bankrupt in 10 years and lose everything. Because the game is created that way. So you'll be in desperate competition with each other to always